Hello and welcome to a new series on my channel where I'm going to be journaling the process of making an 8-bit CPU in Rust. I'm new when it comes to hardware engineering so I'll be using a schematic that Ben Eater came up with to build this CPU. If you would like to see a real life hardware implementation of this CPU you should check his channel out. Ben Eater makes very high quality tutorials. To begin, I started by installing a Rust server on my Linux laptop with Docker. I used an image from Didstopia since it easily set everything up for the server, as well as had Oxide support out of the box. I just made a bash script that created a virtual volume mount for my server data as well as virtually mount in my rust.env file. Once that was done, I ran the image and everything was good to go. While that was setting up, I found some plugins that would help my efforts. I first installed test generator tweaks. This would allow me to set the Rust Watts output on test generators so I didn't need to build a complex decentralized power generation system. Normally in Rust you can only have 15 components from your last root combiner. This allows you to build a limited number of windmills and we need possibly billions of Rust Watts. Once test generator tweaks was installed I configured it to push 1 billion Rust Watts through each of the outputs on the generator. Next I installed copy paste. This would allow me to build modules and be able to save them and paste them as needed, since a lot of the circuits I would be building contained a lot of the same chips like the 74LS173 or 74LS245 chips. The ability to copy and paste would save myself a lot of time. With the server set up and having the ability to save my work, I began on my 8-bit processor. The first step was to create a CPU clock. Looking at Ben Eater's clock design, it seemed to use three LM555 clock chips, which are then wired to a series of AND as well as OR gates. The first step was to build the clock chip. I tried freeballing the clock, but I just couldn't get a working clock going in Rust, so I decided to rip someone else's design off from rusttips.com. The next step was tying this all together and checking the clock pulse. The next piece I wanted to build was the 8-bit register. The design I was using contained three registers. There were two for passing numbers to our ALU as well as an instruction register to keep track of what instruction we wanted our CPU to execute. The register design was pretty simple. We just needed two 74LS173 chips and a single 74LS245 chip. 74LS173 chips are 4-bit D flip-flops that allow us to store 4 bits within them. 74LS245 chips are octal bus transceivers which allow you to connect address and bus lines together. You can then select whether the bus pushes to the address lines or the address lines push to the bus. The 74LS245 chip within the register would always push our address lines to our bus since we would want to move numbers out of the registers only. We would isolate the address lines from the bus lines whenever we didn't want to push data. So I built these chips and wired them up together, and built an 8-bit register. Then I built a simple circuit that gave me a bus where I could set values and flush them into my registers, as well as push values from my registers to, to the bus so I could examine them. Once I had these components built, I decided to flash a number into my register and see if I could read its value, and it worked. So if we sit back and think about everything that was built, I was able to read and write binary to registers, and so obviously the next step was to do something with these numbers. So I began work on the ALU. The purpose of an ALU is to do arithmetic. That is why it is called the arithmetic logic unit. Our ALU would be able to perform addition and subtraction. It contained the previous chips we built as well as a 74LS283 chip, which is a four bit adder with fast carry. I implemented this chip, then pasted all of my other chips together for my ALU and wired them up. I decided to pull the trigger and add two numbers together, 10 and 15, which under normal circumstances should give me 25, but instead I was getting 40. It was completely borked. I tried to debug my ALU, but the wiring was garbage. So it was hard to trace wires and for some reason, left clicking with my wire tool would not render the trace. My ALU itself had an I.O. shield which made it easier to check inputs and outputs to it, but my registers didn't as well as the internal chips inside of the registers. So I decided to scrap everything I had built and rebuild it all using a certain code style. I made a chiplet design. 
I would first build the, this big wooden stage thing and inside the lower area would be all the logic for the chip. So if I built a four bit adder, you would have all the gates down there doing the math. Up top on the front would be the IO. This is where you would connect to the chip. I rebuilt all of my chips and rebuilt my ALU and it was still borked. I would try to add 64 and 64 and would end up with 130 or when swapping my ALU to subtraction mode, I would get a 64. I did some debugging and fixed some chips, but I just could not get the adder to output the proper number. I decided to rebuild everything for a second time and this time test every chip I built vigorously to make sure they performed the proper actions. I also came up with the code style guidelines to make sure I didn't run into issues further down the line. Like for example, I would name all my IO by what's reflected in the bin eater diagram. Some of my chips had the manufacturer's naming conventions for pins and this led to inconsistencies with debugging as well as wiring up all of my chips. The next big improvement was debug displays on the chips themselves. More often than not, I was looking at the circuit internals and would have to retrace the lines to make sure they worked. And finally, I added switches for all of my inputs so I could easily manipulate the chip. After I redid all my chips again, following this new style, I started work on the ALU for the third time, and it was once again borked. I was mad and was flying around and pasted in a second ALU so I could make edits and leave my original intact. When I saved the blueprint, all the lights were on, so I went to clear them. When I did, they didn't clear. The copy-paste plugin was breaking the state on some of my components. This could have been why the ALU was not working. If even one of those components inside of any of the chips were not working, then it could wildly affect the data coming out. I got mad and started talking mad shit about the copy-paste plugin and the Rust game itself. Sorry if you devs are watching, but you would understand engineers sometimes need to vent the toxicity out of our bloodstream so we can get back to work. After I got it all out of my system, I decided I had two options. I could fix the copy-paste plugin and continue hand-building these circuits, which would, which would not be ideal since at this point I'd already sunk around 30 hours into this project with the ability to copy and paste. And the plugin, like many other plugins, were very spaghetti since there was no real structure to the code and it was in one file. Just fixing the plugin would take me a bunch of time and I still had to build the rest of the CPU. My second option was to build my own plugin that would take schematic files from a program called Digital Logic Sim and build them in game. I would just have to figure out the state issue and I could build my 8-bit computer as soon as I got a chip built in Digital Logic Sim for it. This would also allow me to build much more difficult things in the future with ease, like a 32-bit computer for example. I went with the second option and began work on my plugin, since it seemed to save me more time in the long run with this project as well as other projects in the future. And it would also begin a sort of renaissance with circuit designs in Rust. If this plugin was developed properly, it could change the way we build things in Rust. But before we get into that, we're going to leave the plugin process for the next devlog. If you enjoyed my content, please make sure to subscribe to my channel as well as like this video. If you are interested in watching me build these things live, make sure to hit the bell on the subscribe button to get notifications of my upcoming streams and also join my Discord. My Discord is a good way to keep up with me as well as get in contact with me with any questions you have about the project and Rust Electricity in general. Thank you very much for watching and have a good day slash evening. Goodbye.